Hi, good morning everybody and welcome to Microbial Minutes. We are going to talk about the uh, important things that have happened in the microbial sciences in the last couple of weeks. I am going, I'm Julie Wolf. I'm here to talk with you about several things. I'm going to share my screen so that you can see the slides that I will be discussing. Here we go. So um, we're going to be discussing several things that have been hot in the microbial sciences in the last couple of weeks. We are going to talk about how Culex mosquitoes may be a vector for the Zika virus. We will talk about how archaeal DNA packaging is similar to that of eukaryotes. We'll hear about a 30-minute antibiotic susceptibility test um, that offers point-of-care diagnostics and a new clinical trial that has shown probiotics can protect infants. Uh, and finally, we'll talk about pigs that have been engineered to eliminate their porcine endogenous retroviruses and how they appear healthy. Uh, I'd like to encourage you to type questions into the chat box if you have any during the presentation, uh, and I'm happy to answer those um, as we're going through this. So the papers that we'll be discussing are listed here and um, should be included as links below the YouTube um, presentation as well. Diving right in, we're going to begin and end with a little bit of virology today. So the first paper is from Emerging Microbes and Infections and is titled Zika Virus Replication in the Mosquito Culex Quinque Fasciatus in Brazil. The take home message from this study is that Culex mosquitoes may be a vector for Zika virus. This is an important potential finding since we know that Zika right now is transmitted primarily by Aedes mosquitoes. Aedes aegypti is the most efficient vector um, and Aedes albopictus, which can be found in more temperate zones than the tropical Aedes aegypti, can also be a vector. What the authors say in their introduction is that the literature is dichotomous regarding Culex vectors with some saying yes and some saying no. And they claim that this could be due to different mosquito um, and virus genotypes and strains that are used in various combinations in the lab. Citing a report that has found that Culex quinque fasciatus can transmit Zika to mice in a lab when it is artificially infected, they decided to explore this a little bit further and specifically ask two questions. The first question is, um, how do Aedes aegypti and Culex quinque fasciatus compare as vectors in a lab? And the second question is, do the Culex quinque fasciatus in a Zika endemic area carry the virus? And they're going to ask both of these questions by using molecular biology to look for viral genomic material. So in this um, slide uh, here, what we're looking at are some of, oops, what we're looking at are some of the important um, aspects from their findings. On the left-hand side are mosquitoes that have been infected with um, blood meals that have a known concentration of Zika virus. And so we're comparing three different conditions. We're looking at two 80s strains, one which is a lab strain commonly used for studies in the lab, and the others are field collected 80s aegypti mosquitoes. And the third condition is Culex quinque fasciatus mosquitoes, um, seen here with the red. And you can see that between the lab strain and the wild um, field collected Aedes mosquitoes, there's a difference in the number of Zika RNA copies that they are able to detect per mil. And here they're looking at mid guts. They looked at a variety of different organs within the mosquitoes that are important um, and can carry the, um, that can carry this virus. Uh, and mid gut uh, replication is often studied in looking at vector um, ability to transmit disease. So there's a decrease um, in the number of Zika RNA copies per mil when looking, when comparing the 80 strain, the wild field collected strain and the strain that is commonly used in the lab. Uh, and there is also a decrease between the lab strain of 80s and the Culex mosquitoes that they investigated. However, there is no significant difference in the number of Zika uh, genomic copies that they saw between the 80s field strain and the Culex mosquitoes. Uh, and so from this, they concluded that both species can transmit Zika virus 
when they are artificially blood fed with Zika virus. That is what they had written, although this right here, um, this data supports only that both um, species, both, both um, genuses of mosquitoes can carry Zika virus to comparable levels. To answer the next question, do the Culex quinquae fasciatus in a Zika endemic area carry the virus? They collected Culex and Aedes mosquitoes from various parts in Brazil where um, we know that there is Zika uh, endemic in the area. This heat map over on uh, the right hand side shows the hot spots of where human incidents of Zika virus have been reported. And here, the blue and red dots and stars represent different Culex species. So these are the Culex negative results. So these um, blue ones here represent where they found Culex mosquitoes that were not infected with uh, the Zika virus. And these red stars, there are three of them, are the areas in which they had pooled Culex samples that did show positive for carrying the Zika genomic material. The numbers uh, between the pooled Culex and pooled 80 samples were kind of similar in their, uh, the proportion of positive hits, because of course not all mosquitoes are going to be carrying these different viruses. Of 270 Culex um, pooled samples, there were three positive um, hits, and in 117 pooled 80 samples, there were two positive hits. So this was um, something that was written up in a few mainstream articles. Here you can see uh, an article in Genoa Net that states common mosquito can carry Zika virus, Brazilian scientists find. And this is something that uh, can be a little bit confusing for the layperson who is following science uh, through the news since just less than a year ago in 2016, a different study had shown Culex mosquitoes do not transmit Zika virus studies find. So what's the deal? Do these Culex mosquitoes actually uh, serve as a, as a vector in the wild? This seems to be an unresolved question, despite the current research that we're looking at. Uh, and this was um, information gathered from a conversation on social media between different scientists who study vector-borne diseases. Uh, without reading it to you out loud, they are saying that the report that we've just discussed did not look at the infectious particles that were found within the mosquitoes. And this would really confirm that not only is the genomic material there, but infectious virions that can then go on to infect uh, another person were present. And this is good practice in general when one is going against the current conventional wisdom within a field, such as now saying that the Culex mosquitoes can serve as a vector to show things using multiple different assays, um, which really shows the, the robustness of the finding. So this does not mean that Culex mosquitoes do or do not. Um, there is certainly evidence in this report to suggest that they may serve as a vector in Brazil. Uh, however, I think that what this states is that more, what, this, what the real conclusion is, is that we need to do more thorough studies. Um, and so I expect this to be an ongoing um, area of research with Zika virus transmission and something that we will probably discuss in the future uh, microbial minutes. Moving on, we'll talk briefly about this um, report, which was published about the chromosome structure of archaeal DNA. Um, the uh, article is titled Structure of Histone-Based Chromatin in Archaea. And the take home message from this report is that archaeal DNA packaging is similar to that of eukaryotes. So we know that DNA is a storage information molecule and that it's very long um, and organization is important um, both in the nucleus of eukaryotes and within the cell body of the archaeal cells in order to um, organize this properly and be able to activate only the um, areas of the genome that one cell wants activated. In order to, um, to organize this, most cells have a multiple, um, have multiple ways uh, or layers of organization. So here we have a schematic on the right-hand side showing that this should be nucleic acids, not just, um, not just the A, T, Cs, and Gs, but these are base pairs are then going to be wound around um, in eukaryotes, um, histones that are organized into a complex called the nucleosome. This will uh, 
wind even further, um, creating the chromatin structure that can be found in chromosomes. And again, this is a eukaryotic example here. In eukaryotes, nucleosomes are protein complexes that are composed of four different hist histones, uh, histone proteins in an octamer formation. And all of these different histone proteins have what's called a histone fold or HF dimerization motif, which helps to identify them as histones. Bacteria similarly organize their DNA around a different set of proteins that are called HNS proteins. Um, archaea, however, have small HF-containing proteins, which are thought to act similar to histones, but the structure of how they organize their DNA is unknown, or was unknown until this study was conducted. So these uh, researchers wanted to ask, what is the structure of archaeal histone-based chromatin? To do this, they did some crystallography, um, x-ray crystallography. And here in the top panel here, we are looking at um, the histone configuration and DNA round around it uh, from archaea in panel A and in a eukaryotic nucleosome in panel B. You can see the very similar, um, a lot of similarities in the structure simply by comparing these two uh, images. And you see the DNA is wound around on the outside with the protein structure on the inside. When they superimposed these two different protein structures, uh, they saw that there was, and that's what's um, being shown in this lower panel here, they saw that there was superimposition, uh, not 100%, but very close uh, in the way that, very, very close, uh, a lot of similarity in the structure between these two uh, very divergent um, species, uh, kingdoms, I should say. And so from this, the researchers were able to conclude that our data established that most features of eukaryotic DNA compaction into nucleosomes are conserved in an archaeal histone-based chromatin. The histone-mediated DNA geometry within these assemblies is exactly the same. Uh, and so this is really neat. Um, it's uh, a discovery that was previously unknown um, and was written up in several different trade publications, as you can see here. Uh, and in one of these, uh, which I believe was um, this one in genetics molecular um, evolution section of Science News, they wrote that while eukaryotes always tether eight protein clumps, archaea DNA can spiral around stacks of many more histones to create rod-shaped structures of various lengths. So it's not as uniform as in eukaryotes, said lead scientist Caroline Luger. Uh, and this is important not only because it supports the de um, development and evolution of this DNA winding structure in a common ancestor to both archaea and eukaryotes, but also uh, in many of the SynBio um, papers that we've discussed, such as the E. coli movie that was encoded into the um, genome of an E. coli using CRISPR, they're using that, that study used DNA not as a genetic program for E. coli, but as a basis for data storage. And as DNA is considered as a data storage molecule, understanding the most efficient or various ways that different organisms organize their DNA will be important for uh, encoding and decoding different programs that we may put ourselves into this um, molecule. So moving on, the next study that we're going to discuss is from PNAS, and it is entitled Antibiotic Susceptibility Testing in Less Than 30 Minutes Using Direct Single Cell Imaging. And the take-home message from this study is a 30-minute antibiotic susceptibility test offers point-of-care diagnostics. And point-of-care diagnostics is the goal type of diagnostics, meaning that the clinician or healthcare worker will be able to get a diagnostic result either in the presence of the patient or very nearby to the patient, right? Without having to send out a patient's isolate to uh, a secondary facility where they could this, where this could be done. And so we all know that drug resistant infections are a huge clinical problem uh, and that the faster an infection is characterized, not only for the species um, of bacterium that is causing the infection, but for the susceptibility profile of that particular infection, the faster the correct antibiotic can be given. Um, and this is important not only to resolve the infection, of course, but also because that's uh, when given the correct antibiotic, you are less likely to contribute to antibiotic resistance, either of that infection or of neighboring commensal microbes that are also going to be treated with this, these um, different antibiotics. And so the question that this group wanted to ask was whether a point of care susceptibility test 
could be developed for UTIs, urinary tract infections. And they wanted to concentrate on UTIs because they are, this type of infection is very common in women and that there's a, a big problem with drug resistant infections in UTIs. And so to address this, they developed a microfluidic chamber, um, as you can see over here on the left hand side, on the right hand side in um, the schematic form, um, which was able to hold a single bacteria, a single bacterial cell in terms of its width um, in each of its chambers. And you can see an image at 100x magnification down here um, below, where you can see each individual cell only the width of that bacterial cell is able to fit. Um, and as those bacteria divide, they are forced to divide in an upward manner along the, the edge of that chamber. And they then tested the, the growth of these different microbes in the presence of different antibiotics um, that are used to treat UTIs. For this particular study, they looked at clinical isolates that had previously been characterized because this is really a proof of principle type of um, type of study. And so what they were able to find um, is using this, this microfluidics chamber, they can treat some uh, wells with media that does not contain antibiotic and some wells with media that does contain antibiotic. And here you can see a difference um, in the growth in terms of the number of cells. So this is um, looking at the relative length of the, um, of the cells that are growing along this same chamber over time. And you can see in the presence of um, no drug that the cells are able to divide at a particular rate. And then in the presence of drug, a susceptible strain is going to divide much more slowly. So here we can see eight, if you look very closely, you can see that there are eight single cells end to end here. And here there are something on the order of four cells. And so you can even graph this um, relative length in a more traditional type of um, growth curve as you see in panel C here. They did this many different times um, and using various isolates um, so that they were able to see reproducibility within the system. And then they took the information for each of the antibiotics um, and saw the, determined the length of time that was necessary in order to see a difference in growth using a 99% um, confidence interval. So in this case, uh, the treatment population starts to diverge in this panel on the right uh, within about three minutes from that of the um, reference population. And so from these numbers, they were able to determine that in as little as three minutes for growth in the presence of certain um, antibiotics, and as high as 11 minutes in the growth, for growth in the presence of um, ampicillin, they were able to see a difference between susceptible and resistant strains and determine the susceptibility profile of these particular isolates. Now, uh, not only is this time extremely, extremely short in determining whether uh, an infection is antibiotic resistant or susceptible, 11 minutes uh, on the long end here is extremely short. But from the time that it takes to load the sample um, to get those cells into the chamber to actually having the data in hand, that means graphed and analyzed and being able to say susceptible or resistant, takes only 30 minutes from loading to the answer. This is really fast and uh, about as ideal as one could imagine. Um, right now it takes about two days in order to um, determine whether or not cells are able to grow in culture or on a plate in the presence of a particular drug. And so this, this is cutting that time immensely and would greatly improve the outcomes of many patients. Uh, and so this is not something that is ready to deploy just yet. Um, this was all studied, as I said, with with isolates that had been previously characterized. Um, they were, this is all uropathogenic E. coli that they are studying and um, the system needs to be optimized for different types of bacteria, different shapes of bacteria, um, different body fluids. So um, collecting isolates from urine may be different than for blood or saliva, uh, as well as other confounding microbes that may be present in a non-sterile body fluid. So saliva inherently has a lot more 
um, a lot more bacteria. You can imagine a skin infection would also have other confounding microbes that may uh, require a bit more um, finessing of the system. However, uh, nevertheless, this is a very exciting finding that um, people were very excited to share on social media. Um, as you can see here, one user saying that this tech could be game changing. Um, this was written up in a number of different trade magazines uh, since this represents truly a confluence of different fields working together. Um, you have a write-up in chemistry world. Um, there is a write-up in um, a, genetics, uh, a genetics magazine, and they included a lovely video where you can see real-time uh, the growth of these different microbes uh, in wells that have different treatments and how each well has different uh, growth rates. Uh, and the lead scientist, Johan Elf, spoke with um, Infectious Disease Special Edition saying that this, for example, makes it possible to prescribe antibiotics that we have stopped using because the local resistance has reached 20%. Although the drugs can still be used for 80% of patients, as long as we can determine which 80%. So not only is this going to help people with um, resistant infections get prescribed the correct, um, the correct medication, it will also broaden the use of drugs that have been put out to pasture because the resistance um, uh, proportion is too high in certain populations. Uh, Elf went on to say that the study shows that actual point of care solutions for antibiotic susceptibility testing are possible. Uh, and that's great. I mean, this is probably just the um, first iteration of um, a device that will prove to be very useful in years to come. And so stay tuned to Microbial Minutes and hopefully we'll have more updates about uh, deployment of this device in the future. Our next article is from Nature and this is a, an article that's titled A Random, Randomized uh, Symbiotic Trial to Prevent Sepsis Among Infants in Rural India. And this uh, take home message from, the, from this article is that large clinical trial shows probiotics protect infants. Uh, and so this is a somewhat controversial area, um, probiotics and prebiotics and whether they work. This is one of the questions being addressed here. Um, probiotics and prebiotics being two sides of the same coin, both are uh, used with the goal of getting healthy microbes or microbes that will confer good health outcomes um, to benefit human health. Um, we want them to grow. So probiotics are the actual microbe themselves and prebiotics are some sort of compound, often a microbial nutrient that will encourage the growth of a particular strain or um, species of microbe to grow in, an, in a certain niche. So the, the scientific team here is addressing the use of pro and prebiotics um, to treat sepsis or um, possible severe bacterial infections in neonates in India. Now this uh, is not lumped, this is all lumped together, I should say, because possible severe bacterial infections are, it's a large bucket into which a lot of infections are dropped in areas where the diagnostic capabilities are not strong enough in order to um, distinctly diagnose every infection. Uh, and so the the scientists had thought that neonates in particular would be a good target population to test pro and prebiotics on because they have a less complex intestinal microbiome um, than um, adults or even older babies uh, as they are born free of microbes and acquire their microbiome through breastfeeding and interaction with the external world. Uh, and this, they hypothesized, would make colonization of these neonates with a probiotic strain more feasible uh, and there had been some previous small um, clinical studies that had suggested efficacy of this sorts. So they um, began a randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled trial of the oral symbiotic Lactobacillus plantarum. And they chose Lactobacillus plantarum specifically after looking at a variety of different strains and their abilities to adhere to gastrointestinal epithelial cells. Uh, and the researchers had previously found that this particular strain was better able to adhere, thus um, possibly promoting its growth to a better degree than other potential uh, probiotics. And they administered this as a symbiotic. So in addition to adding the Lactobacillus plantarum, they also um, uh, provided a fructooligosaccharide, which promoted the growth of this Lactobacillus plantarum strain. 
And so they call this treatment a symbiotic, which is a combination probiotic and prebiotic. They administered this symbiotic to um, infants for one week uh, and then monitored them for 60 days, so about two months after, uh, after having given them this symbiotic to see how their health incomes were affected. These infants were in one of 149 randomly chosen village, villages, uh, and there were over 4,500 enrolled infants. So this is a really large, powerful um, clinical trial. Uh, and so there, there actually is not a whole lot of data. If you look at the article itself, there are two different tables. And this is the second table that shows the outcomes, uh, the health outcomes of these um, infants um, with the um, control or um, infants that were not given the, the bacterium um, and prebiotic together, um, and those that were given the symbiotic found here. Uh, and I have highlighted already the sepsis rate among these different infants. So in the control group, there was 8.9% of the population that was diagnosed, that were diagnosed with um, sepsis, whereas in the symbiotic, um, population, there was only 5.1%. Uh, and so while this represents a 40% reduction, the scientific team estimated that the reduced risk would really represent uh, a reduced risk of somewhere between 25 to 50%, which is a significant amount for um, a bacterium that was administered once uh, for a one week period um, for the following two weeks or two months for it to continue to confer its good health benefits. The types of sepsis that they saw decreased were both of the gram negative and of gram positive organisms. Um, and in addition to a decrease in sepsis, they saw a significant decrease in diarrhea um, and in local infections. So it looks like the symbiotic uh, treatment may have had an effect on other types of infections as well. This uh, was a widely publicized article um, that was written up in many mainstream news articles, uh, including The Atlantic, where the first author, Pinaki Panagrahi, said that in most studies, people take probiotics that are available on the shelf without asking why that probiotic should work in the disease that they're interested in. Uh, and Panagrahi went on to tell NPR's Goats and Soda science blog uh, that we screened more than 280 screens strains in preliminary animal and human studies. So it was a very methodical practice. And this really shows the power of um, both clinical uh, trials as well as the systematic methodology of choosing the right strain and not just using any strain that is labeled as a probiotic in order to confer health benefits for a specific outcome. This uh, news was also widely shared on social media with um, one user saying to remember it's the probiotic and the prebiotic um, and not simply the probiotic itself. The probiotic bacterium by itself was not tested, so there's no conclusions about whether the bacterium alone would confer those health benefits. Um, further, there were some folks joking about um, the different sources of these bacterium probiotics are commonly found in fermented foods such as kimchi and pickles. Uh, and the same user said that uh, if I know newborns, it's gonna be real easy to get them to eat kimchi, uh, kind of joking about the sources of probiotics and whether it would actually be used in this um, sort of a source, but I found this a little amusing and thought I would share. All right, we're gonna move on to our final article for microbial minutes um, for uh, August 21st, and this was a paper that was published in Science titled Inactivation of Porcine Endogenous Retrovirus in Pigs Using CRISPR-Cas9. Take a message from this is that pigs engineered to eliminate porcine endogenous retroviruses, or PERVs, appear healthy. Uh, so why are we talking about pigs? We're talking about pigs because they are one potential source of xenotransplantation, which is the practice of taking organs from one species and putting them into a different species. Many people talk about using pigs um, because there are slightly less ethical implications than using um, related species or species that are more closely related to humans, um, such as chimpanzees. Um, however, tr uh, transmitting the organs of one species to another species has a lot of different risks, including the transmission of retroviruses that are endogenous to that first species. In this case, they're looking at porcine endogenous retroviruses, the PERBs. Uh, and the 
the machinery that keeps those retroviruses quiescent or keeps them from jumping around within that first species may not be present in the second species. And it's possible that um, one of these pervs, when put uh, into a human, um, if a, a uh, porcine organ is put into a human, that those pervs would be reactivated and could then insert somewhere else in the human genome, causing some sort of genetic anomaly and possibly leading to some uh, bad event such as cancer. And so the, this group has been addressing this problem for a little while. Um, this study is actually a follow-up to a 2015 study where they took a pig cell line and eliminated the PERVs using CRISPR-Cas9 and showed that this inhibited transmission of PERVs to human cells. Uh, and so in this study, they wanted to look at actual pigs um, and what uh, they wanted to not only look at um, what the, the uh, effect was on these pigs, but to see whether the, the pervs themselves play some unknown role in development, in genetic regulation, in some sort of pig health that uh, might yet be unknown. And so to address this question, as they did in 2015, they used CRISPR to engineer a pig fibroblast cell line to eliminate all of the pervs that are inside of that um, pig genome. They then took the nucleus of one of these cells and did somatic cell nuclear transfer, taking that nucleus and moving it into an engineered embryo. This is the same technique that was used to make Dolly the sheep um, many years ago when, when cloning was first um, a new technique. They then took those embryos and put them into sows to develop into pigs, um, and the sows eventually gave birth to, to these different pigs. While they were undergoing the engineering step, they learned several things about the, the um, requirements or the, the way that CRISPR interacts when there are many different targets inside of a genome. So the area within the pervs that they were targeting was the POL gene. This POL gene or polymerase is necessary for the retrovirus life cycle. Uh, and so they designed two different guide RNAs, which are the, the um, piece of genetic material that target the CRISPR, uh, or I'm sorry, the Cas9 um, endonuclease to make a double-stranded break um, in that area with the idea that non-homologous end joining would cause a frame shift or some sort of mutation within that catalytic core of the POL gene itself. However, causing 25 different double-stranded breaks within that um, porcine fiber breast cell line led to activation of the apoptotic machinery, and they weren't able to get 100% of those um, of those copies eliminated until they added a P53 inhibitor so that they were inhibiting the apoptosis machinery from um, undergoing automated cell death. Uh, once they added that P53 inhibitor, they were able to reach 100% um, efficiency and eliminate all of those different copies of the, the PERVs. So, Using this technology, they were able to find that the pervs, they, they um, confirmed that pervs can be transmitted from a pig cell line to a human cell line, um, as I'm showing you here uh, in the right hand side. With increased exposure, there are increasing numbers of pervs within an exposed human cell line. And they went on to show that an infected human cell line can then transmit those pervs to a new human cell line. But I should emphasize that all of this has been done in cell lines and there is no evidence yet that pervs can be transmitted to humans in an in vivo system. There are no people who have had uh, a porcine endogenous retrovirus um, discovered in their genome. Uh, they were further able to confirm that these perv free pigs that were born can be generated by um, the uh, SCNT, and that the pigs do not get any of the pervs from their surrogate sows. So the sows in which the, the engineered embryos are incubated um, and developed, they are not themselves perv-free, and it's possible that those retroviruses could jump from the sow to the developing embryo. Um, but some of the pigs, so there were 37 pigs that were born, and some of them have been sacrificed, and their organs um, have been looked at, have been um, interrogated for genomic material for these different pervs, and none of them seem to have active um, pervs within their genome. 
Uh, and the pigs, these pigs, such as this is Laika, um, this pig right here that I'm showing you, this named after, it was the first pig that was born, that was perv free, named after the first dog to go into outer space. Uh, these pervs do not seem to be required for pigs to develop into normal animals. There is no role um, of pervs for embryonic development or um, uh, development uh, that has been detected yet. And the non-homologous end joining um, remains intact, so the uh, meaning that all of the pervs are still inactivated in the pigs that have been born. Uh, and so this also made um, big waves in science news. Uh, this was written up in um, New York Times, it was written up in Newsweek, in Stat News, uh, with a number of different scientists involved in organ transplants um, speaking up. Dave, uh, David Claussen, who's the chief medical officer for United Network of Organ Sharing, said this could be a real game changer. Um, but some were a little more skeptical with Dr. David Sachs, um, a professor of surgery at Columbia University, saying, I am afraid that he may find these goals more difficult to achieve than he expects, but I would be happy to be mistaken, with the he being George Church. Uh, whose lab, um, from whose lab the company that, ex that did these experiments, um, eBiogenesis, um, performed these experiments. And if you're interested in hearing more about this particular study, this was uh, recently um, a topic of TWIV, and so here is the guest from that TWIV, Stephanie Langell, um, speaking about um, the wonderful discussion that um, was held on uh, creation of pigs free of endogenous retroviruses uh, and calling it life-saving tech. And so we'll link to that TWIV, the most recent TWIV number 455 as well. All right, so um, we've learned a number of different important things that have happened in the microbial sciences. Um, and with that, I'd like to thank you for attending um, and uh, hope to see you at our next microbial sciences, uh, microbial minutes, where we will discuss what important has happened in the microbial sciences. That next one will probably be in three weeks, since two weeks from now is Labor Day already. Yes, summer is just about over. Thanks everyone for attending. I hope you have a great Monday. Go out and enjoy the eclipse if you are able to, and we'll see you in a few weeks at the next microbial minutes.